irrespective of its size. The firm needs to make a certain profit, and the profit is there to make the owners happy. When the owners are shareholders, a higher profit of the company they have uh, shares in, in the higher the higher the profit of the company they have shares in means that more dividends will come to them. So they're happy. The prospects of higher dividends also drives the demand of those shares up, which raises the stock price of the firm. So the owners are happy and senior managers are also happy. Um, when the firm is a family-owned business like Wiesmann or IKEA, the profits or the losses, of course, remain within the family. Now, either way, higher profits are good for the firm. That's what firms live and die for. But, but when they're trying to maximize their profits, the firms are typically constrained. We've seen a few examples of constrained optimization problems earlier when we talked about consumers maximizing utility subject to a certain budget constraint. Now the firm is doing exactly the same from a conceptual standpoint. The firm is acting like an economic agent who chooses something in order to achieve an objective. The objective is to maximize its profit. But profit is derived from selling uh, from selling goods to a marketplace, which does not have an infinite buying power. So that's what constrains the firm, the demand for its products. Ultimately then, then the firm is choosing its price and output to maximize its profit, subject to a certain demand constraint. But how exactly in the f is the firm doing this? The first element of our optimization process is your constraint your market. This is what your feasibility constraint was always about, yeah? how much you can actually achieve in terms of profits. Now, once you know your market, then you're trying to squeeze as much profit from it as you can. Making less profit than the market allows you to is a pure waste of resources and, and pro probably a waste of talent. And making more than the market allows you to is just infeasible. So again, just like with the consumer, there will be a point which satisfies two conditions at the same time. It maximizes the value function that the agent cares about. In this case, it's the profit, subject to the demand constraint which is known in advance. Your marketplace, right? So as a result of this maximization process, you will know a very important combination of a price and a corresponding quantity which maximize your profit. P star and Q star here stand for the profit maximizing price and quantity. So let's go through the moves that a firm makes then. You, you want to know your demand first. So suppose you sell, let's say, Cheerios. You know that if you charge $7 per pound of Cheerios, no one will buy them, right? So. You do know that because you've collected some data from the stores you sell in and you know approximately how much consumers are willing to pay for your Cheerios. And actually, there are methods to estimate demand curves, but those methods are not exactly the purpose of the current video. The point here is, if you want to know your demand, you can. You can never know it perfectly, but you can always try estimating various points on the demand curve so that you know approximately what's going on with your feasibility constraint. Now, once you know your demand, you can start building various scenarios about your profits. So let's assume your cost, uh, costs are two per unit. You don't get to produce each unit at a cost of two, but the cost of an average unit is two. That's why we call these costs average costs. They're showing you the total costs you incur per unit of output. So in this case, those total costs per unit of output, or in other words, your average costs, are two. Then let's think about it. You're selling a quantity of Q at a price of P. If you sell a million pence at a price of a pound per pen, then you got a total revenues amounting to about a million pounds. 
So this is exactly what happens here. Your total revenues are the product of how much you sell and how much you sell each unit for. That's how you get your total revenues. Now, let's think about your total cost for a minute. You know that your total costs are the product of how much you produce and how much each of those units of product costs on average. In other words, your total costs are the product of the average costs and the quantity you produce. Why? Well, use your, use your, use your understanding of average costs for a minute. By definition, average costs are total costs divided by quantity. Then Q cancels out and as a result you get back to the identity. Total costs is identical to total costs. So we have just shown that total costs are equal to the average costs times the quantity you produce. But then we have everything we need to arrive at the profit. Your profit, denoted as by the Greek letter pi, is by definition equal to the difference between total revenues and total costs. But let's use the definitions of total revenues and total costs we have laid out above. If you use the definitions of total revenues and total costs, then your total profit becomes PQ minus ACQ. But then we can take Q out of the parentheses and arrive at a point, uh, at a profit per unit times how much units you sell, right? So, and if we use the fact that our unit costs are just two, then our total profit will become P minus two, times how much we produce and sell. Then let's do a mental experiment. What if you want your total profit to be zero? Your target profit is zero now. What's your price? Well, let's think about it. If your P is equal to two and your average costs are two, then your profit is zero, right? No matter how much you sell, if you sell everything you've got for just about how much it costs you to produce it, you will not make an economic profit. We can place all those prices for which your economic profit is zero on a curve. Well, in this case, it's not a typical curve because there's just one price which delivers a profit of zero. So your curve, which indicates a, con a constant profit of zero, will be flat, equal to the price just about equal to the average cost. However, notice that once your price becomes greater than your average costs, your profit turns positive. But then notice one curious fact. Once your profit is positive, you can have all kinds of combinations of prices and quantities which yield a constant profit. Take, for example, a profit of 10,000. You can achieve a profit of 10,000 with a quantity of 20,000. In this case, your profit margin should be just 50 cents above average costs, or 250. Right? However, if your scale is smaller, if you're not able to scale up to 20,000, let's say you stick with the scale of 10,000, then you need to charge a price of 3 to arrive at a profit of 10,000. Three is a price which is one dollar higher than your average costs. Now, if you multiply this average profit with how much you sell, you arrive at your total profit. The point here is, and this is very, very important, that you can choose all kinds of combinations of prices and quantities to arrive at a profit of 10,000. We call those combinations of prices and quantities which deliver identical profits with the fancy name ISO profit curves. You can keep varying prices and quantities to arrive at a different profit level. This ISO profit curve, for example, shows you all the possible combinations of P and Q delivering a profit of 23,000. So if you target a profit of 23,000, you know what those combinations of prices and quantities are. And you know the, price and the, the prices and quantities for a profit of 34000 and so on. So let's take a profit of 60000 There are infinitely 
many uh, ways you can make 60,000. But let's just focus on three of them here. Right? So, um, if you sell 60,000 units of, the, of, of your product, then, you can pri then your price needs to be just one above your average costs of two. Right? But if your scale is not big enough, say you sell just 20,000, then your price needs to be equal to your average cost plus a margin of $3 per unit of output, which is one. And the smaller you get, the bigger the profit margin needs to be so that you end up with the same profit. For example, if you, if you, just, um, if you sell just 10,000 pack uh, packs of Cheerios per year, your price must be way above its average cost for you to get a profit of 60,000. Then your selling strategies must accommodate that need to charge such a high price. You better make those Cheerios really, really special before you ask a price of eight, for example. So look, let's place all those eyes of profit curves on a map. Each of those eyes of profit curves shows combinations of P and Q yielding identical profits. So your goal is to get on a, to an eyes of profit curve which is as high as possible, right? But at the same time, you're very much constrained. Your constraint is the demand function you're facing. There are certain things you can do to affect your demand, but for now, you're working with a constant demand curve. So ultimately, when you try to get on the highest possible isoprofit curve, given your demand, you end up with a combination of prices and quantities, which we call equilibrium. You can't do better than this, given your constraint. So the firm is constantly facing a constrained optimization problem. How to choose my price and how to choose my quantity so that I maximize my profit, knowing that at the same time I'm constrained by the demand curve. In the general case, there will be a combination of P and Q, which are both feasible and maximize the profit. In this particular case, a price of 440 um, and a quantity of slightly over 14,000 will do it. The maximum profit, which the firm can get meanwhile, is um, 34000 So, now you know how the firm prices its products and determines its quantity. An interesting follow-up question to the problem of profit maximization is, can I do something about my costs? And can I do something about my demand? If I can, my profit curves will look different and my demand constraint will look different as well. So potentially this means I can get more profit out of this market, or I can change the market. I can change more, sell more, and profit more. In the next videos, we'll be discussing those problems the firm faces. So keep watching.